Dr. Elling, previously we touched on the rarity of portopulmonary hypertension. Let's take a, a, a deeper look at, at how common it is and, and how does it develop? Okay, very important question. First, as we talked about earlier, you have to have portal hypertension to develop portopulmonary hypertension. So you're now selecting patients with cirrhosis, then sub-selecting patients with portal hypertension, and then a fraction of those individuals will go on to develop portal pulmonary hypertension. So you can see how this is getting to be a smaller and smaller number of patients affected by liver disease. So you have to be looking for it and you have to be vigilant because we don't know when it's going to develop in our patients. It can develop at any stage of liver disease. So what do we know about prevalence? Well, we know from a study in the 90s looking at patients with liver disease, of the 500 patients followed, about 2% of those individuals went on to develop portal pulmonary hypertension. So again, a rare disease, but something that is extremely important when you're talking about patients going towards liver transplant. It becomes more and more common as the patients are seen self-selected being evaluated for liver transplant. If you look at another study, specifically assessing patients' prevalence for portal pulmonary hypertension when they're being seen for liver transplant, it's anywhere from three to 6% of those individuals. And that's, that varies because people have used different definitions for this condition over the years. Now, traditionally, and what we use when we assess patients are the WHO guidelines, meaning a mean greater than 25 and a PVR, that's elevated more than 240, our risk assessment when we go to liver transplant is using similar kind of numbers with the patients having mean pressures of more than 35 being highest risk and those having pulmonary artery pressures and pulmonary vascular resistance greater than 250 having the high, highest risk for poor outcomes with surgery. So in our registries, these patients occupied a small fraction of the patients followed in PAH centers in the U.S. In the Reveal Registry, there was about 5% of all the patients being affected by portopulmonary hypertension. Now, interestingly, in the French Registry, it was 15%. So depending on your location, geographically, you may, have, may see more of these individuals. I see a fair number of patients with portopulmonary hypertension because of the liver transplant program we work so closely with. So this number probably will increase over time as we've recognized that we can, ass we can assess these individuals and treat them, and this is not a life sentence. These patients can be maintained on therapies and can be liver transplant candidates in the future. So why does it happen? Well, we have individuals with these portosystemic shunts, and we believe that because of these shunts, our lungs are now seeing mediators they're not supposed to see if your liver is well. These vasoactive mediators and this angiogenic factors are hitting the lung blood vessels, causing changes over time. This is all theory because we're not exactly sure the mechanisms of this, but this is our, our general accepted idea of why this is occurring in the lungs. Now we also think, think there's some role for inflammation and maybe some role for shear stress because early on, before these patients develop more advanced right heart failure, they may have very high flow states because of their liver disease. So it's a compilation of injuries to those pulmonary blood vessels causing intimal changes, muscularization, increased vascular resistance leading to the pulmonary tension. Now, those things are part of it. Then you have to have the right individual. The individuals that are most likely to develop portal pulmonary hypertension are like any other form of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Those are the individuals that are female and have underlying autoimmune disease. So those are the people we really have to have it on our radar. Think about this is somebody, the minute they have worsening shortness of breath or change in their swelling that we need to reevaluate for the presence of portal pulmonary hypertension. So we're talking a lot about the importance of recognition and knowing what signs to look for. And you mentioned vigilance. How does somebody who doesn't see a whole lot of these patients learn to be vigilant? So I think what's very important is you can have the whole spectrum of symptoms in an individual. You can have somebody with pretty significant portal pulmonary hypertension that feels well, 
and someone who has mild disease who's very dysmic. So if you encounter a patient who has liver disease, known portal hypertension, and you're assessing them for their well-being, and you're assessing them to potentially refer them for transplant, one of the first things we do is do an echocardiogram. And we look not only at the pressures, but also at the right heart. And if there's any signs of pulmonary hypertension, or if there's any symptoms that concern us for pulmonary hypertension, we evaluate them. And we don't stop at maybe, we stop at the right heart cath, proving what the pressures are and dictating how we manage it. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Ellen. Thank you.